wanted to introduce myself and um, have my wonderful co-hosts introduce themselves as well. Uh, my name is Molly Miller. I'm the Student Development Specialist for the Department of Interdisciplinary Learning and Teaching. Um, so that does mean that I work with our graduate and doctoral students. Um, I work with our students mostly on um, policy and paperwork issues from anything from admissions all the way through their life cycle as a student to when they graduate. Um, so I deal with those things and um, work with our students here in the department. So why don't um, I have Dr. Alanis and then Dr. Demande and then Thomas um, introduce themselves, what they do in the department. Um, and also maybe if you could just briefly touch on what your areas of research interest, that sort of thing. Okay, thank you, Molly. Um, I'm Dr. Ileana Alanis. I'm a professor of early childhood and elementary education in the department. And um, my research area is looking at very young children, three, four, five-year-olds in dual language programs, uh, particularly as they engage in dyadic structures and how those structures help children develop language, cognition, um, social skills, et cetera, um, and really looking at how teachers are structuring those tasks. But I'm also the graduate advisor of record, which you know in education, we use a lot of acronyms, so it's the GAR. And essentially I coordinate the doctoral program in ILT. Um, and so if Molly handles a lot of logistics and then I handle a lot of uh, approvals, um, coordinating different uh, projects, fellowships that we offer in the department. So I'll turn that over to Dr. Demande. Something like that. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say thank you, Dr. Alanis. Um, my name is Bexison Demande. I'm an associate professor in this department of interdisciplinary learning and teaching. Um, those of you who are choosing uh, the area of curriculum instruction, you'll see me more there because um, my focus is on curriculum and instruction and teacher education. So I, I do work uh, on issues of equity and diversity, how that affects uh, curriculum, particularly I'm looking at um, marginalized students, how um, they get affected by, by these issues, including the current issues. So um, I'm actually standing for um, Professor Maria Araguin Anderson here um, as an interim uh, graduate graduate advice of record for master's degree. I'm still learning how to say that because I'm an interim <laughs> until she comes back. Uh, but that's what I've been working with Molly on with master's students uh, mostly. So, um, and I look forward to working with um, all of you in the master's uh, program and including the PhD program too, <laughs> because I also uh, will be teaching there uh, in the spring. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Thomas Rux. Um, I received my master's degree in special education from UTSA, and I'm also currently uh, going into my third year as a doctoral student in the IOT uh, department. And so um, from a student perspective, I can provide, um, you know, from the master's point of view and uh, right now the PhD point of view, um, the different uh, aspects that the program offers. And so I look forward to answering any questions that you guys might have. All right, thank you guys so much. Um, so we'll just move forward here um, with the programs that our department offers. Real, real fast, here are some um, pictures that I am very grateful uh, to Thomas for providing um, some of our doctoral program um, and some of uh, Dr. Alanis. This is just um, some of the friendly faces from our department. And we also have, um, this is not all of our faculty, um, but some of our faculty up here at the top is the, our department chair, Dr. Anne-Marie Ryan. Um, Dr. Alanis is here. Dr. Demande, you are not pictured um, in this slide, um, but uh, as I said, this is not, not all of our faculty. Down here at the, um, I will just point out down here at the bottom, Dr. Marone, Dr. Fees, um, and Dr. Yuen, our, our instructional technology fac faculty, Dr. Kalanick 
Craig, Dr. Munoz, um, our CNI, Dr. Boone and Dr. Ewalt, our uh, special education, Dr. Cortez, um, Dr. Uh, Audrey Gunnarsson, and of course, Dr. Alice, our uh, early childhood elementary ed. And um, we also have our reading and literacy, Dr. Martinez, Dr. DeGiulio, um, and Dr. Reha. Um, not pictured is also Dr. Harmon. Um, and like I said, we have, we have some more faculty. We're a large department with five um, program areas. Um, you'll see the, that reflected in our five master's programs and the five cognate areas in our PhD. Let me go on to, to the programs that we offer. Um, like I said, we have five master's degrees um, in those five areas, curriculum and instruction, early childhood and elementary education, reading and literacy, special education, and we have an MA in education with instructional technology concentration. Um, then in our doctoral degree, which I'll go into in further detail later, um, also has those same five cognate areas. Um, we also offer a graduate certificate in interdisciplinary STEM education. If you're interested in earning just that certificate, or um, as we learned in the presentation before, a lot of our master's students and even our doctoral students add the certificate on while they're currently pursuing their program. Um, the other thing here I just wanna point out is the certification options available. That's through, we do have what is called the Make It program. Um, that's an MA, CNI, plus initial teacher certification. It's kind of a mouthful, so we call it the Make It. Um, that's the acronym that we use, and that's where you can get your master's degree plus initial teacher certification. But there's only two specific tracks for that. It's fourth through eighth um, math and science and fourth through eighth English language arts, reading and social studies. Um, so I'll, I'll be going over those programs a little bit more. The other certification option we do offer is a professional certification through TEA for reading specialist. Um, that's through our MA reading and literacy program. Um, and we have the option where if you, you know, you can pursue the degree and the reading specialist certification program at the same time. If you already have a master's degree, it is also possible just to pursue the reading specialist certification. So um, I can kind of go over that just a little bit later. But those, are, those are the certification options we offer. Again, here are the other breakout sessions, just in case you're not going to be covering the program that you were interested in. Um, these are the other ones, Bicultural Bilingual Studies, Counseling, Educational Psychology, and Educational Leadership. Um, so these are, this is just, um, just a quick glance of our numbers of graduate students. Um, and you can see that you know, our, our largest programs by far are CNI and special education. Um, we also have um, a pretty sizable PhD program. Um, so this is just kind of to give you an idea of the numbers of our, our graduate and PhD program. So um, these are the application deadlines for the master's programs. Um, fall 2020, we're still accepting applications. So if you're interested in joining us this fall, I definitely recommend that you um, apply sooner rather than later. Um, just because fall classes do tend to fill up. Um, these will be the, the future deadlines for spring 2021 and summer 2021. To my knowledge, um, those term applications haven't opened yet, um, but they, the spring 2021 will probably open soon this summer. Um, but to my knowledge, right now, all you can do is apply for fall. Um, Moving on here, these are our admission requirements for um, all of our master's programs. Um, and we look at GPA in the last 60 credit hours of coursework. Um, we look also at the academic background that you have. Um, we're looking for at least 18 undergraduate credit hours in education or related field. Now, um, if you don't have the academic background, that does not mean you cannot be admitted to the program. It may mean that you uh, may be assigned one or two background courses, and I'll go over that in just a minute. Um, 
We do typically require TOEFL and IELTS scores for international applicants, but right now, with the current situation, that is, that is waived. We do not require GRE scores for any of our applications. Um, we do not require letters of recommendation, resume, or statement of purpose. If you want to submit any of those items, you are welcome to, though. Um, I have lately um, been receiving a lot of issues from applicants about the letters of recommendation, saying they can't submit their application without putting in a recommender. Uh, what the graduate school told me to do is actually in the name of the recommender, just put no recommender, and then the contact info, put your own email, and then of course don't reply to any email that the system sends you asking for a letter of recommendation. Just don't reply but it, if you put that in that will signal to the graduate school that you do not want to submit your application with letters of recommendation and we don't require them so that's not going to be an issue so moving on here what if you don't meet um, those requirements like i was saying um, if you don't have the 18 credit hours in education or related coursework um, you may be assigned one or two graduate level background courses. These are extra courses that you would be required to take um, before you graduate, but you can take them with your um, coursework within your degree. So they won't count towards the degree, but you don't have to take them prior to entering the program. Um, also, if you don't meet the GPA requirement of a 3.0 in your last 60 hours, um, you can be admitted if you have a 2.7 to 2.9 um, on academic probation. That just means that in your first semester, you need to make a semester GPA of 3.0 or above, um, or else you would be placed on dismissal for the next following semester. Um, but if you have a 3.0 or above, you go back into good standing. That is what that means. Um, now, we also offer special graduate admission if you don't meet the probationary requirement. So that's taking a look at your GPA in the last 30 hours instead, and it's the same requirement, 3.0 or above in the last 30 hours, um, or 2.7 to 2.9 for probationary admission. Um, but special graduate admission, um, of course, you're going to basically be classified as a non-degree seeking student, so that does make uh, seeking financial aid somewhat difficult. Um, also, uh, you would need to reapply after taking 12 credit hours in the program. Um, so once you're admitted, you know, if you take 12 credit hours, once you're admitted, those 12 credit hours can count towards your degree. Um, and that's special graduate admission. So um, moving on to our program requirements. Um, our degrees are 36 credit hours um, or 33 credit hours for the thesis option. Um, most of our degrees, actually all of our degrees do um, allow for a thesis option. The, the exception of course is going to be the Make It program um, because you're, you're gaining your initial teacher certification. So there's really not much time for writing a thesis. Um, that's, uh, that's a really difficult in-depth thing to do while you're also student teaching, so we don't ask that of you. Um, so that would be our exception there. But all the other programs, if you're just on a regular track for curriculum and instruction, you can um, choose to do a thesis. If not, each program has their own, what's called a comprehensive experience um, that you would complete in your last semester. For some programs, this is uh, kind of like a present, final oral presentation. Um, for some, it's uh, like a written, like an essay. For uh, curriculum and instruction, for example, it's a portfolio, a physical portfolio. And then for instructional technology, it's an online portfolio. So each, each program has their own um, way of, of doing that last comprehensive exam or comprehensive experience. Um, in each degree, there will be your program emphasis courses, um, which are required for your degree. Um, also, as in the previous slide, the core courses, which are required, 
um, the electives we call support coursework. Um, and so you would work with your, once you're admitted to the program, you're assigned a faculty advisor. Um, you would work with your faculty advisor to kind of determine your support coursework for your, your electives for your degree plan. Um, some programs uh, are a little bit stricter than others, but I know that most uh, of our faculty advisors, they want to work with you and figure out, you know, what interests you um, and try to tailor your degree to, to make it what you need uh, just to fit your interests. So um, just kind of going over our classes now, of course, uh, with things the way they are at the moment, uh, we've been doing online instruction only. Um, but this is how typically how our schedule is um, in a typical semester. We do offer hybrid and online courses. Um, we, do, we do offer face-to-face -face courses. They would meet once a week um, in the evenings from 6 to 8.45 p.m. Um, summer courses may be a little bit different only because um, they are in a shortened semester. Um, fall and spring semesters are about 16 weeks long. Summer semesters are 10 weeks. Um, and some of the summer classes are in even shorter terms. Um, so there are maybe some classes offered in the day during the summer, but during fall and spring, face-to-face -face classes are offered in the evenings. Um, we also offer classes both at the main campus and downtown campus. Um, and right now we are they, we are in the process of getting the special education program and the instructional technology program all online. Um, so those are going to be going online very soon, hopefully. Um, just a, a quick glance at estimated cost of attendance. This doesn't include any extras. Um, this is just tuition and fees, although I did include the college specific fees in here. Um, I have the link to fiscal services in here um, if you want to look at their website, but they won't. If you do look at the fiscal services website at the tuition fees there, they don't include the college specific fees. So if you need to take a quick picture of this, um, like I said, this presentation will be shared online, so you should also um, be able to access it that way later on. Um, but these are our tuition and fee rates for in-state and out-of-state. Three credit hours, of course, is going to be one class. Um, most of our students uh, who are teaching full-time, they may take, depends, you know, it depends on the person what they feel comfortable with, um, but typically I recommend someone who's teaching full-time fall and spring, just take one to two classes um, and, and go, you know, go part-time if you can. Um, Full time for a graduate or doctoral student is nine credit hours, which is three classes. All right. So moving on to our CNI program, um, this is just a little bit, a, a little snapshot of CNI. Um, and Dr. Demande, I don't know if you really quick wanted to add anything while I'm on here. Yeah. Um Actually, you're doing really great. I was enjoying listening to you. But those courses that appear on the screen, uh, those are the core courses that you will have to take in order to uh, complete your master's uh, program. Uh, you'll see when you start um, the degree, you get a degree plan. For example, um, Curriculum instruction and assessment will be under the core curriculum courses as well as research in action, um, including the 6673 policy and critical issues in teaching, which I'll be teaching this fall. So um, grant writing as well, as well as the 6123. But also if they are not listed as um, the core courses, you could also add them in the last, how many more um, elective? I think we have like for 18 credits uh, on that. Molly, how many on the degree plan? Um, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but it's 36 credit hours in right. total. 
right, but I was just talking about the elective. Yeah, three, so, three core classes and uh, I believe, yeah, 15 or 18. Right, right. So, uh, so all of these uh, courses that appear on there will be um, really fundamental for you um, if you major in curriculum instruction. We chose those as uh, the core of understanding curriculum and um, curriculum issues or curriculum studies. All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Demande. I'll sure. move on um, to early childhood and uh, ask if Dr. Alanis, if you have anything um, to add really quick to this description. Um, uh, our, you know, I, I'll just say in general that regardless of the cognate that you choose, um, they will all have core courses that are in your program of study. And once you get admitted to the program, then your assigned advisor will work with you as to what courses you need to take. So the biggest thing to remember is don't register for a course unless you've already talked to the advisor and she's a, he or she's approved it um, because we don't want you to take courses that are not part of your program of study. Um, and then you know later you find out you just took some extra courses. So what's really important is once you get admitted into the program, visit every semester with your advisor regarding what you need to take. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Dr. Alanis. May, may I add real quick, I think Dr. Alanis has said something really, really important uh, where a student may say that, um, oh, well, it's right in front of me here. I can choose. I see the catalog and all that. And then it turned out that um, although you may have taken that course, but it does not complete the calculation to 36. Uh, 36 hours. I think Dr. Alanis' point is very important uh, of you checking in with your advisor. I always tell uh, my advisees that um, I need to see your progress report as soon as the semester is over. I want to see, uh, you know, how your degree uh, plan goes. Uh, just one more thing without um, delaying Molly's presentation is um, I think Dr. Alanis was talking about that, but I wanted to say it again that um, on your degree plan, you would see that this is the core requirement and the cognate requirement, and then you'll have electives. So uh, my style of advising would be to tell students that um, make sure that um, you start with the required courses in that way, you are able to take them when they are offered. And then the other ones then, as you move along, not to say that you cannot put others here and there, but only after you discuss with your advisor. But the core courses are important uh, to complete first on a degree plan. Would you agree, Dr. Alanis? Yes, I just, um, again, if you just, every semester, visit with your advisor, um, because we also know there are some courses that are only offered once a year. There are some courses that we would say, um, this is a good class to take in the summer. <laughs> so, you know, just keep checking every semester with your advisor versus, um, oh, I have my program of study and I'm just gonna yeah. follow it along the way, the way you think is best, because the advisor knows what courses are gonna be offered and how many are offered every semester. All right, thank you guys so much. I'll move on here um, to our instructional technology program. Um, this is one of our programs, like I said, that is moving online. Um, as of right now, the courses that you're seeing there um, that I've listed, pretty much these are all off offered online already. Um, so they're just in the process of making the entire degree um, an online degree. Right now, it's, it is mostly online coursework. Um, that, that we offer for instructional technology. Um, so I'll keep going for reading and literacy. Um, I'll go ahead and let you know a little bit about the reading specialist certification. Um, if you, uh, you know, if you want, you can always pursue, like I said, pursue the master's degree in, in reading and literacy and the reading specialist certification at the same time. We have a track set up for that. Um, however, I know there are students out there who already have a master's degree and they're just looking to get the reading specialist coursework um, and get that certification. Um, and you can do that, but you do have to apply 
to the Master of Arts in Reading Literacy program first um, before you can apply to the certification uh, part of the program. Um, so it just requires clear admission to the program or if you were admitted with um, conditions that you clear those conditions first and then you can apply to the reading specialist program. Um, so it is actually a separate application. Um, if you have questions about, you know, more questions about this, um, I'll be sharing my email later and I'll share it in the chat later. Um, and we can also go over your questions at the end. Um, but it is, uh, for reading special certification, it's going to be a two-part process, similar um, also to make it. Um, the certification part will actually, um, you'll apply to the certification track later in your program of study. So going on to special education, we're undergoing some changes in this degree. Like I said, it is being put um, all online. Right now, most of the special education coursework is offered online. Um, we will no longer be offering the ABA track. Um, so if you are in, interested in um, ABA, we do offer that track um, and that program for you to become BCBA eligible um, through our educational psychology department. They offer an MA in, education, in educational psychology that would lead to that, and they also offer a graduate certificate. So um, if anyone needs to, I can, I can put it back on the, the other breakout sessions. Um, just let me know in the, in the chat if I need to do that. Um, so we'll keep, keep going here. Um, this is just a little bit about our programs. This certification, like I said, we offer the Make It with those two tracks. Um, the Department of uh, Bilingual, Bicultural Bilingual Studies also offers um, the TESOL degree with uh, EC through 6 um, or the Bicultural Bilingual Education EC through 6. Um, these are, you know, kind of limited tracks. So if there's another certification track that you're interested in, say like um, 7 through 12 math or English, something like that, Spanish certification, um, we offer a bunch of different certification tracks through our accelerated certification program. Um, and unfortunately, that those programs can't be, you, you can't use, typically do both um, at one time. The reason being that the accelerated program is undergraduate level coursework. The master's degree is master's level coursework. So if you are a recipient of financial aid, this doesn't tend to be to really work out. Um, but in any case, we do offer the certification tracks if you are if you are looking for them. Um, so let me keep keep going here. Uh, our graduate certificate is the interdisciplinary STEM education. Um, our classes for the iSTEM they usually take place. It, it's two classes, but they take place on the same evening with alternating for alternating weeks. So one week you'll have one class, the next week you'll have the next class. Um, so that kind of, we do have a lot of students who are very interested in adding this on to their degree. Um, a lot of CNI students typically tend to add this on to their degree. It's of uh, no additional cost to you if you're already a master's student. If you are um, not looking to get a master's degree and just want the cer certificate, you can do that. You apply um, to the certificate program as a special graduate and just submit um, a graduate application. But if you are already in a master's program, there's just a one page application I'll give you. You fill it out. Dr. Cardmona, who's the um, program uh, advisor, will sign it and we'll get you into the certificate program. And now, going into our PhD program. Um, very exciting. Um, just a little bit about uh, our PhD here, and just to let you know that um, the application cycle for fall 2020 did close back in February. So um, the next opportunity to apply would be for fall 2021. Um, we only admit in the fall. Um, that's because we have a cohort model. So all of our 
our students start on the same page each fall in a cohort. Um, we put it on here, uh, like I said, it's a cohort model, it's community-based. Um, maybe at this time, uh, I'll let Thomas, who is one of our wonderful um, PhD students, speak up a little bit about his experience in the, in the PhD program, if you'd like. Sure. Um, hi, friends. Uh, like Molly mentioned, um, the program starts in the fall, and it's a cohort model. And um, it's, a, it's an interesting piece because you meet the same or you meet students and you progress at the same time. Uh, some students are part time and some are full time. But like, uh, like we've been talking about, you follow a course sequence and we meet every semester with our advisor, whether you're a master's student or a doctoral student, um, that point of emphasis is to meet with your advisor. And, um, you know, as long as you follow the, the program and you, you put in the work and you put in the effort, everything seems to fall into place. And that's very much part of that community-based model and that you are not alone and no one expects you to do anything by yourself or in isolation. And I think that's a point of emphasis right now to make, especially in COVID-19, in that if we're doing distance learning, do not feel that you're by yourself. Um, there's, the university provides uh, excellent support um, at all levels, undergraduate, uh, graduate, and postgraduate levels uh, to make sure their students are well taken care of. And so as a whole, um, uh, the, the program is, is, is amazing because you learn how to integrate different uh, methodologies, different, um, um, different subjects, and you integrate them as one. And so um, I come from the background of special education, and Molly showed different slides of the different programs, and we truly learn how to integrate almost each one of those into one nice PhD program, and uh, that makes us better students at the end. And so for a little closure for this, um, the community-based piece is very important to me as a teacher um, of secondary students. And uh, to see that as a teacher of a pre-service teachers myself, uh, the university does an amazing job again of just making sure you're not alone, um, there's support uh, all along the way. And so Molly um, and, and her team uh, as well, um, they provide uh, excellent support. You have questions, you email, there's chats. And so there's so many different ways uh, to get support. Thank you so much, Thomas. Appreciate it. All right. So these are the degree requirements for the PhD. In total, it's 60 credit hours uh, of coursework. Um, there will be 12 hours of research methods courses, 18 hours of core ILT courses, 18 hours of Cognate courses. Um, also, each fall for your first three years, you'll take a one credit hour a research seminar class with the rest of your cohort, um, kind of adding to that community sense, that community feel. Um, then at the end of your program, while you're writing your dissertation, there will be nine credit hours of dissertation. Some students do end up having to take more than nine hours, and that is okay, because um, sometimes life happens and it takes a little bit longer to write the dissertation than you had originally intended. Um, and, and we, have, we also have part-time students in the PhD program um, who need a little bit longer as well to write that dissertation. So that is okay, um, but only nine credit hours do count towards the degree. Um, also other milestones, other requirements in the program, there is a written and oral qualifying exam. That qualifying exam happens towards when you're finishing up your coursework and ready to move on to working on the on first proposing and then uh, writing and defending your dissertation. Um, so it's kind of a major stepping stone there. Um, but those are those are some other requirements of the degree. At the end, of course, is the dissertation defense in your final semester. Um, and then graduation. Uh, and you get to be called doctor. <laughs> And this is kind of um, just something I've created because I have a lot of questions about, well, how long will this take me? And it, it really just depends on whether, you know, you're going to be a part-time student or a full-time student. Um, I'll be going over this a, a, in a little bit, but um, our funded fellows are full-time students. Um, and as you can see, as a full-time student, you have the potential to complete a lot faster but some people that's just not possible. They can attend our, our program part-time. Um, so this is kind of a timeline um, for how 
they get that done. Typically for our full-time students, it only takes about three to four years to complete. Uh, for our part-time students, it could take four to six years, sometimes over that. Um, we definitely want, you know, everyone, like Chris was saying in the previous pre presentation, we want you, uh, you know, to be successful here, but also be successful outside of UTSA. So um, there is a time limit on doctoral coursework. It's eight years. Um, so after that, things get a little bit difficult when you try to graduate. You have to petition for your coursework. Um, so it's not like an unlimited time, but eight years is it's a, it's a pretty good time to complete uh, even a doctoral degree. Um, these are our five cognates. As I was saying, um, each of our master's programs area areas are also cognate areas. If you did attend one of our master's program and you're interested in attending the um, PhD program, you can absolutely apply. Um, you would work with your um, advisor, like Dr. Alanis was saying, like Dr. Thomas was saying, like Dr. Yamande was saying. You work with, closely with your advisor um, to figure out what coursework you would take um, for the cognate um, and to tailor it to your interests. Um, the, the degree does provide you, is supposed to provide you kind of with a background in each, um, but you have those cognate courses to specifically focus um, on one area, especially if you're not coming from um, a master's background in one of these areas and you want to teach in that area, the cognate courses allow you to teach at the college um, or university level. Um, as it is here at UTSA and most um, SACS accredited universities, it's um, 18 graduate level credit hours in order to teach at the um, university level. So that's what those cognate areas give you. The other thing um, I do want to quickly mention for the application, you do have to claim which cognate you are applying to. That is a requirement of the application. Um, yeah. So I'm gonna also, I'm going to interrupt for a minute, Molly. Yeah. Of course. For those of you that are interested in a PhD program within our department, um, as you get ready to apply, definitely reach out to me and I can help you with, you know, if you're trying to choose your cognate area, I can help you determine uh, what would be best for you so that um, if, if you need to talk to another faculty member that's in that area for more information, I can uh, direct you to them. So as you're getting ready to apply and you're trying to figure out which cognate you should choose, reach out to me as the GAR, and I'll help you with that decision. Thank you so much, Dr. Alanis. All right, um, moving on here, these are the requirements for our um, PhD program. Um, again, we do, do require GRE scores for the PhD application. At this time, um, they are still required since our, um, you know, our next application cycle is fall 2021, hasn't opened up yet. Um, who knows what may happen with the present situation. Uh, my advice is to keep checking, check in with me. Feel free to check in with me at any time to see if that, you know, is still a requirement or if we're waiving that because of, uh, you know, coronavirus present situation. Uh, or you can also periodically check the graduate school's website. They have um, really kept their COVID-19 uh, specific information on their website very updated. Um, so you can always check that as well. Um, uh, same for TOEFL and IELTS for international applicants. Um, also, just another thing to note, um, we do typically uh, have interviews for applicants. So uh, it, that doesn't mean if you are selected for an interview, that doesn't mean you're automatically in the program, but we just ask that you agree to participate in an interview if you are invited. But typically, uh, we do have interviews. Um, so I'm just going to just cover briefly two items, the statement of purpose and the CV. Um, so the statement of purpose will actually serve as your writing sample. Um, and these are things you should speak to. Um, definitely include your cognate choice, uh, your short and long-term goals. Um, I've 
included the Princeton Review and Kaplan um, advice on crafting a statement of purpose, but of course, there are other guides out there. Um, these are just ones that I found. Um, and going on to the other item, the CV, resume or CV, um, this is just to see what your professional, professional and academic experience has been. Um, again, I, I just found Indeed's guide to formatting the, the CV, but also at UTSA through our um, Career Center, they actually have samples of resumes and CVs for college of application for college of education applications. So um, that would be that's a great thing to explore as well. Um, definitely list, you know, on your CV, on your resume, list uh, if you've already been published, uh, if you have had any conference presentations, um, any any sort of professional association that you have, um, any awards that you've received, um, and of course your your teaching or education-related experience. Um, as I was saying, our fall 2021 uh, cycle is coming up. The deadline will be February 1st, um, 2021. Uh, you can, it will open up before that. Um, most likely it will open up, let's see, probably about, in the probably about this fall um it should it should open up around i want to say at least july or august um but feel free again to check in with me and see if it, it, it has opened up so as soon as it opens you can apply early um but the deadline will be february 1st um and of course the, by February 1st, all the um, required materials must be submitted. The other thing um, I just want to take note of here on the um, application process is the fellowship applications. If you are interested in being a funded fellow, um, that's a you know, full-time student that works for us in the department um, or teaches for us, uh, and you receive um, a fellowship that covers your tuition and fees uh, plus a stipend, um, if you're interested in that, um, I send out the fellowship applications just right after the um, final application deadline has closed. Um, so if you submitted an application, I send that to you. Um, and that's a separate application that you, you apply for through our department. Um, so this is the overview of how our admissions process works for the PhD. Um, you'd submit your application. The committee re reviews it. There may be an interview. Um, you'll also submit your fellowship application if you're interested in a funded fellowship. Um, and then you make the decision. It's the same, uh, it, it, it will be the same as uh, Chris described it in the previous presentation where you would receive the final decision via email by the graduate school. Um, and then fellowship decisions, that would actually come from us from the College of Education, you would receive a letter via email. All right, um, a little bit, just a little bit more about the review of applications. Um, they will be reviewed on a rolling basis. Um, so if you do apply early, um, they, it will be reviewed. It may not be reviewed right, right away, um, but they are reviewed on a rolling basis. Um, they typically try to, I, I will say, I say that because they typically try to interview more than one, one person. Um, so as soon as we have a, you know, a couple of people's interview, um, then we can, you know, begin that, that process. Um, and like I said, your official decision will come from the graduate school via email. Um, one thing to note is that our P for our PhD program, it is competitive admission. Um, so just meeting all of the requirements does not guarantee admission into the program. Um, and moving on a little bit more about the fellowships, um, these are limited in number and subject to um, the availability of the funds that we have. Um, typically, they require 20 hours of work in the department um, per week. 
so you're a, um, a part-time employee, but it is a lot of work on, on top of a lot of work because you're a full-time student in the PhD program. So uh, don't be fooled by the 20 hours of work. It's, it is a lot, um, but our, our fellows do seem to enjoy it um, as well. But the one thing I do want to note here is that our fellows can't hold outside employment. So for a lot of people, that is that is the kicker, um, unfortunately. But that is that is what the university requires. So just a little bit more on being a fellow: advantages and disadvantages. Obviously, um, you can't have a second job outside of the uh, the job that you hold with the department. Is a disadvantage. But the advantage is that most of our funded fellows, because they are full-time students, they finish, they finish up the degree faster um, in three to four years. Um, being here all the time at the university does allow um, for more opportunities for connections, um, to do research. Um, you're, you're connected no matter what, even if you're a part-time student, but you have you know, more hours in the day where you're here on campus um, and just having that opportunity also um, to teach our college students here at UTSA and get that um, academic you know, experience in academia teaching college students. Um, other disadvantages would be um, fellowships do count towards that total of financial aid that you can receive. Um, so this may limit some of, of your other financial aid uh, eligibility options. Um, Full-time enrollment um, is really very demanding. Um, even with the part-time, you know, even though it's just part-time employment, you know, you're going to be teaching for us and doing research um, with our faculty. So it it can be uh, very demanding. Um, limited. Uh, funding is another disadvantage you know each year we just have to wait to see what we have um, and you have do have to apply each year even if you're a returning student um, so this is uh, where I'll leave off and I'll um, open the floor now for any questions and leave it here just in case you need my email address thank you so much